it's just a pleasure to be back. Last time I spoke for one of these, everybody got up and walked out on me. It's, I think, the one and only time I've ever been interrupted by a fire alarm. How many of you were there in 2004 when that happened? Huh? And we just made it something prophetic. I don't remember what, but to the prophetic, everything's prophetic. We got something out of it and ran with it. It was awesome. So if it happens tonight, one of these prophets will get a word. I was thinking when Nani was up here sharing, you know, I, was, I, I hadn't really thought about the offering before the service. And sometimes when I'm on the road, I give, sometimes I don't. I just, you know, and the more she talked, the more I thought I'm going to have to give. <laughs> and then Barbara Yoder leaned over to me and said, I, I, I wasn't necessarily going to give again tonight, but I'm going to have to give. And then she looked at me and said, get him, looked at the others and said, get him an envelope. He's going to give too. And I was thinking about that Bible roulette thing she does, you know, where she opened her Bible and got a word from God. I call it Bible roulette. It doesn't work for me. It works for my wife, Cece, but it doesn't work for me. The only time I've ever really tried it is back in the early 80s. I was a part of a staff in a congregation. I was just a young sort of assistant to somebody in Oklahoma. But the church was just really messed up and having a hard time. And I... I just thought, Lord, we need a word from God so desperately. And I'm going to try this. It works for Cece. I know you'll do it for me because you're no respecter of persons. And I grabbed one of these modern translations and closed my eyes and flipped it open and put my finger on the page. And the verse that my finger was on said, my shepherds have become stupid. And I said, I knew that stuff doesn't work for me. I can't get a word from God that way. I'm never going to do it again. And I, lo I love the hearts of all these ladies. By the way, Nani, I, I did one of these genealogy tests recently where you can figure out your, your, your genealogy, your lineage, where you come from. I've been told all my life I was mostly German, but I'm actually over 50% British. So... I just feel like I've, and not to insult the Germans, but since the Brit took the offering, I'm proud to be British, okay. <laughs> and before I forget it, they've told me, I'm, my staff has told me I'm doing a book signing after this uh, session. So I can promise you I won't be giving prophetic words. Barbara Yoder will stay as long as you want and give prophetic words. <clears throat> I do not interpret dreams at these things. I do not give words. I just sign the book, which makes it worth a fortune. <laughs> Chuck and I have been on a 22 city tour. He called me recently, you know, a few months ago, and he does this once in a while and stuff. I've heard from God for us. <laughs> we used to witness to people in the 60s and 70s, and our opening line was, Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life. I tell people now, Jesus loves me and Chuck Pierce has a plan for my life. <clears throat> but my schedule was already pretty full when he called me. I'm sure his was too. And uh, he said, God's told me we have to go to 22 cities together. And I thought, well, okay, sure, that's easy. Well, this is number 18. We were counting this as one of the cities that we're doing together. We're gonna to finish the 22nd city. It'll be Washington, D.C. and on February 22nd of next year because that's the 10-month point of Chuck's word that he received in May when, when the Lord told him there would be 10 months of turmoil and chaos, basically. But at the end of those 10 months, there would be a breakthrough and a turnaround and we'd have three years of breakthrough. So we're gonna meet there and um, that'll be our 22nd city but this is number 18 and do it a little differently obviously we usually sort of tag team in services 
and he'll do half a message, I'll do half. We both kind of pray and prophesy, but he said, I'll just do the morning, you do the evening, and you just have to listen to what I say. And, <laughs> and just flow with me. And I said, well, whatever you say. I felt uh, uh, an amazing weight of the Holy Spirit on this gathering all day. I feel like this is more than an anniversary, a 50 year celebration. This is more than that. This really is a recommissioning. This really is a, a new mantling. What Chuck did this morning, when he and I draped that mantle on Jane was by the way for all of you and it was significant it was more than a token it was a word from the Lord and I was listening and I do try to chronicle what he says when we do these together and say now Lord what do you want me to add to that and one of the I'm going to start with this tonight one of the phrases that really leaped out at me this morning when he was speaking was when he said this is your breakthrough portal year. This is your breakthrough year, but then he said it's a portal year, and then he said this is your breakthrough portal year. And then he made some kind of a statement about me teaching uh, sometimes on the seasons of God. Now, I'm not going to be able to do this uh, uh, in as in-depth and lengthy a way as I sometimes do, but I am going to give you a, a, a brief summary teaching for maybe 10 minutes or so on this point so I can expand on that just a little bit but in the Greek New Testament there are four words for time or that have to do with time and many of you know those words 30 years ago nobody had heard of Kairos now every charismatic believer knows the word Kairos Kronos and Kairos but I have found four one of them I feel is especially important for you now. By you, I mean this ministry. But I'm also kind of including people who aren't necessarily a GLOW members because this is a word for us, the praying church, the apostolic prophetic company that God has raised up in the earth. So the first word is chronos. Let me do this quickly since I know most of you know this. First word is chronos, which means a general season of time. Starts here, goes here. Could be a month in a person's life, could be a 10 year period. It's a, it could be a 40 year period. It's a general season of time. We get the word chronology from it. We get the word chronicle from it because people chronicle events in time. But in every wind, in every season, in every chronos season, you will always come to a point where it shifts into kairos. And we know that word, it means a strategic time. It's not general anymore, it's become something strategic. And most lexicons, in fact, any good Greek dictionary in defining the word kairos will always use the word opportune or opportunity because a kairos is a window of opportunity. It's not the general time, chronos, that something is done. It's the strategic time that something must be done. You may, <clears throat> you may be a farmer, and you may have, you may be in a chronos season of sowing and watering. You have the mundane. You take care of you know, removing weeds. You make sure the that the the insects don't destroy the crop. You make sure there's water. It's a chronos time, but you are going to hit that window and you can't, it's non-negotiable. When the harvest gets ripe, you're in the kairos. You better reap because you're in a window of opportunity. And you can apply that to any really part of life. You can impart it to corporations, nations, you can apply it to individuals. So you come to this kairos season. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He said, you missed the kairos of your visitation. Then there's a, a third word that I have found. This is really what I want to amplify for us tonight. This is more the portal because Kairos is a window, but you come to a point in a Kairos season 
where it's the now time that you have to go through. You, you better pull the trigger now. And it's used in Acts chapter 3 in the story of the man that was healed at Gate Beautiful. And the Lord was taking me back to that passage a few years ago and I, I knew he was trying to tell me something and so I read it for days and days and days and I finally told the Lord, I know everything to know about that passage. Please leave me alone. Actually, I didn't tell him that. I didn't want him to know what I was thinking. That's just what I thought. <laughs> and finally, I just, it, it was just, he was, he was just dogging me. And finally, I just decided I'm going to look up every word, no matter if I think it's insignificant. And so finally, I came to the name of the gate. Beautiful. And to my surprise, I found that the word beautiful does not mean attractive. It doesn't mean <clears throat> lovely or pretty or beautiful in a physical sense. It is a word that means beautiful in a timing sense. It's a circumstantial beauty. It's the Greek word horeos from the Greek word ora, which means time. Horeos literally means the right time. It's only rarely translated beautiful and only when circumstances have come together, all the right events or timing or people, all the things that need to happen for that breakthrough, for that window of opportunity to finally be seized. When all that happens at the right time, that's a horeos and it creates a beautiful thing. Isn't it fascinating that God in his sovereignty made sure that this gate was named horeos, right time. Always wondered why God, the Father, or Holy Spirit, had Jesus walk by this man probably dozens, maybe a couple of hundred times, who sat at this particular gate. In his sovereignty, he not only named the gate decades before this, but he, named, but he also made sure that the family, when they wanted to place this man somewhere so that he could make a living by begging, placed him at the right gate. And all Jerusalem, all of Israel, not just all of Jerusalem, all of Israel knew who he was because they, at the feast, they all walked by him many times. They all knew him and Jesus walked by him many times. So it must have come as a bit of a surprise to Peter and John when Holy Spirit suddenly said, I want you to heal this man. My first thought would have been, who am I to do this when Jesus himself didn't do it? If Jesus didn't feel led to do it, why, why would God want me to do it? But this was different and they knew this is the right time. Peter, under the leadership of Holy Spirit, just grabs the man and he's instantly healed. Why did God have Jesus walk by him dozens of times? Because he was waiting for the right time because he knew that the early church would need a miracle of this caliber that would speak to the entire nation. Everybody knew who Joe was. And now he's running through the, no, not this guy. He's been at the gate beautiful for 35 years. His limbs are twisted. He's never walked. God would have had to, in a fraction of a second from the time the hands met to the time he hit his feet, recreated bones, re-put ligaments in there, straightened things, did something to the brain so he would know how to run and walk instead of having to learn how. All of that would happen to happen in a fraction of a second. You can't tell me Joe is over here running through the temple and leaping and praising God. Oh, yeah, it's Joe. I saw it. 5,000 people get, we know at least 5,000 because that, that's how many were saved. The whole city gathered because they all knew who it was because God knew that at the right time there would need to be a miracle of that caliber take place to validate their message. And then, of course, the fourth word is plerao, which means fullness of time. Once he's running, that's fullness. But my point to you, and the reason I tell that story hurriedly, because as you can see, it's a message, is that that horeos moment is the portal. God takes us through the chronos times where he's preparing things behind the scenes. He's watering the seed. We are tending to the seed, Nani. We, we have to take what he has said and and tend it and make sure we do the right things with it. He takes us through that season and then we hit the point of strategic timing. We need to start thinking a little differently now. 
That's where this ministry has been. That's what I can guarantee you. I haven't said in one meeting, but I can guarantee you the leaders of this ministry have been crying out to God saying, what is next? We know something is coming that we have to step into. I can guarantee you. I haven't asked him. I just know it in my spirit. And now I'm saying to you, the portal is when you come to that time where you have to step through by faith. The portal, the horeos, is when you pull the man through the window. There will be decisions, and by the way, that can be a moment or that can be a month or that can be a year, but it is, a, it is an important window. It's a window of the window. It's a portal in the spirit. And I'm going to say to you prophetically right now that new doors are about to open for this ministry and that which has been accomplished by this ministry as great as it has been is a first fruit, is a small fruit compared to what God is about to do. Because what God is about to do in the earth is it, we have not seen anything like it in history. We are about to see the greatest outpouring of Holy Spirit's power and anointing, the winds, the rain, use whatever you want, picture you want. We're about to see the greatest outpouring of Holy Spirit of the, in the history of planet Earth. This is going to transform nations. And as it were a moment in a day, we are going to see Muslim nations that, were, that, that are called Muslim nations now that will not even be referred to as a Muslim nation 10 years from now. And I'm going to tell you, God has positioned this ministry spiritually and in some ways practically, geographically. He has positioned this ministry to be one of the, a point of the spirit, one of these strategic, uh, well-placed, well, I don't want to use the word in the, in the carnal sense or the secular sense, but even in an organization, an organized sense, you are positioned to, to pull a people through a window. This is the breakthrough portal year. You will make decisions this year that set the course for the next 10, 20, 30. I don't know which conference, in which, during which conference I said the following, but I know one of the meetings uh, national or international gatherings of a, girl, of a glow, I made a statement that God is giving this ministry an opportunity that few ministries ever accomplish. And that was to be a strategic integral part of more than one move of God. Because in the 60s, when Aglow was raised up, Aglow became one of the strategic ministries, as far as I'm concerned, of what God was doing in that movement. And it never lost its freshness. I don't know, ne never, I don't know the history well enough. All ministries kind of sometimes go through some times where we have to readjust. But I will say, I've watched pretty closely, pretty carefully. And that because of the leadership of this ministry, it, is, it has always remained a new wineskin. It's probably because of the prayer and the hunger for the word and the and the open hearts to listen to what God is saying to the church today, to, to embrace the, the prophetic movement and the apostolic movement and to stay connected with people that were voices in that. And, it, and, and through that, this ministry has stayed fresh and has stayed alive. And I say to you, not only were you one of the key ministries in the charismatic movement of the 60s, 70s, 80s, but you will now be one of the key ministries in the third great awakening that God is about to do on planet Earth. And so expect the spirit of wisdom and revelation to begin to manifest in a fresh new way in this ministry and in the board meetings and in the leaders and among the leaders of this ministry. Expect prophetic dreams. Expect visions. Expect prophecy to come forth even in your board meetings that set the, set the, the, the agenda for the coming days, weeks, and months because you are in a portal right now and you're going to hear strategies that will absolutely change this planet. Amen. 
And that's point number one. That's an important point. This is not one message about the same subject. This is a couple or three, depending on how much time we end up with. Already took longer on that one than I intended. That's an important word. A new wineskin has nothing to do with age. It has everything to do with the heart. God spoke, I don't want to start wondering up here, but he spoke to me a couple of decades back, I don't know, maybe somewhere in the late 90s. And he said to me, you are well on your way to becoming a wise old wineskin. You can have wisdom, but not have current revelation. An old wineskin is not a, uns, it's not a person that's unsaved, and it's not a person that doesn't like God anymore. It's a person that cannot receive the new. They've not stayed flexible enough to embrace the new and flow with it. And I started watching and I found wise, very wise, old wineskins. Great wisdom from yesterday. But today, today's wisdom is yesterday's revelation. Processed over time to become wisdom. But there's revelation for today that will be tomorrow's wisdom. I don't want to harp on this too much. But well done, leadership of the glow, for remaining a fresh wine skin that can move in both wisdom and revelation. Now, the second word I feel like God has given me for us, for you, has to do with history. I have a friend who had a dream recently, a prophetic dreamer. God uses her in our lives once in a while. She's one of our personal intercessors. And she had a very short dream. And in the dream, she was in a conference that was across the street from an antique store. And the name of the store was History, in all capital letters, History. She went over to visit the store, and while she was there in the dream, the Lord said to her, you're going to need some of the things in this store to accomplish the prayer assignments I'm going to give you in your future. You're going to need some things in your history in order to accomplish the future. You can't get stuck there, but some of it you can never leave. And I'm just going to say it this way. Some of the promises that God probably, that God probably, probably, some of the promises he gave to leaders and people in this ministry 20, 30 years ago are for now. Some of the prophetic words that are maybe a decade or two or three old are for now. Not only must we honor those who go before us and honor the price they paid to give us that history, but there are things hidden in our history that we may think are old and antique. Antiques, but God is saying, you need that for now. It was a part of a meeting with Chuck in, I don't know, maybe October of last year. Quite sure it was actually. I can't believe it was a year ago, but time flies when you travel with Chuck Pierce. <laughs> but I was frustrated a little bit because I knew there was an assignment for me. I travel the nation all the time. I was it 77 cities last year in America? I'm on a pace, pretty much match it this year. Because I feel like we're in a Kairos, moving to that Horeos when the third great awakening is going to explode around the world. And I feel like my part as a forerunner is to keep stirring prayer and keep people's faith alive. I'm a forerunner. So I'm staying busy and I was there and I knew there was an, a prayer assignment for me that I was not hearing. And I didn't know if it was I couldn't hear it or 
or if God wasn't yet saying it, but I was speaking for him in one of his conferences and I looked at him, stopped my message, looked right at him and people thought I was having fun with him. They started laughing, everybody but Chuck. He knew I was serious, I was serious. I looked at him, I said, you need to get a word from God for me. <laughs> people did just what you're doing. Oh, that's funny. Except for Chuck, he went, and he ran to the platform and I finished my message. He said, I got the word when you said it. And he sent me, I, Jesus loved me, Chuck Pierce has a plan for my life. He prophesied to me a seven city, seven day, seven days from now, you must go to seven cities in America, one a day for seven days, take a team, go back to the cities where God established his a covenant, where covenant with God was established in this nation. And you go back and you reestablish covenant with him in those seven cities. Retrace, he said, the steps of covenant. He rattled off six of them. I knew what the seventh one was. I, I, I sent a text to 20 friends of mine who were leaders in ministry that I knew had enough understanding maturity as intercessors and leaders to be a part of a trip like that. I sent them the cop, a, a, a recording of the, of the word and I said, I'm looking for those that can drop everything, change their schedules and do this with me for seven days starting a week from now. You have plenty of time to pray about it. Give me your answer in the morning. <laughs> 13 people, we went to the 13 original colonies. I didn't ask one of them, please do this. That's just who said I'm supposed to be a part of this. 13 including me. I say all that to say, and then he said, by the way, after you do this, the voice of the Lord will return to this nation. I tell you, expect the spirit of revelation. If you're not moving in it, it's your own fault. God is speaking. God is speaking. But it's not only a word for America, it's a word for the praying, prophetic, apostolic church. But the key to what God wanted to do in the future was to go back and redig some wells. The key to what God wanted to do in the future was to go back and find what he said to this nation 200 years ago, 250 years ago, even back in the 1600s when they landed at Cape Henry and planted a cross on the beach and prophesied the destiny of America. The destiny of America was, is, is not a mystery. He prophesied it right there on that beach. The gospel will go forth from, not on, from these shores, not only to this land, but to all the nations of the earth. That's the destiny on, of America. But sometimes you have to go back in order to go forward. Sometimes you have to reconnect in order to move ahead. Sometimes you have to say, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Because what I need for now and tomorrow is in my yesterday. And I'm gonna give you four quick pictures of this and then I'll see if I have time for another point. But the great, one of the great pictures of this power of history is in the story of David and Goliath. And I'd read that story for years and this is another time when God kept taking me there and I didn't tell him because I didn't want to hurt his feelings. But there was nothing else he could show me from that passage. I just had the thought. Now I knew he was trying to tell me something so I started digging. The whole thing is, the whole mindset that David entered that battle with was based on his history. You know he wouldn't call Goliath by name, don't you? David never called him by name. He only referred to him as the uncircumcised Philistine. It's kind of weird, isn't it? You're about to have a fight with somebody and you want to harass them and you say, you're uncircumcised. Doesn't make any sense unless you know what he's saying. Because it was a sign of covenant. He was basically saying, I'm in covenant with God, you're not. I'm going to beat you because of what a man did a few hundred years ago. And I'm a part of his lineage. And through that, I'm in covenant with God. And that makes you his enemy. That makes my enemies God's enemies. That means today I'm going to win and you're going to lose. It really doesn't matter what happens on the battlefield. The only thing that matters is what happened back there. So I'm in covenant with him and you're not. 
And then the passage is quick to tell us the location. I read right over that. I don't care if it's in the valley of Elah and Sokal, which is a part of Judah. Get on to the good stuff where his head gets cut off. And then the Lord started focusing me and says, it may not be important to you, but it sure was important to David because David was of the tribe of Judah. And the whole point was, just like the covenant with Abraham, he's saying, in essence, you're going to lose, and you're not going to take this land because a few generations back, God gave this land to me through my tribe and through Judah. This is my territory. You can't have it. There's nothing you can do to get it because God's already given it to me. This is my land. And then David said to his brother when he was being mocked, who do you think you are? And David said, is there not a cause? And that's a very challenging word for the translators because David may have been saying, is there not a cause worth dying for? Is there not something bigger than even our lives at stake here? Come on, we got to rise up and meet this and challenge and answer the, the call because the cause is worth it. But did you know the word could also be translated history? David may have been asking the question, is there not a history? Don't we have a history with God that we can grab hold of that will give us enough faith and confidence to go face this giant? What about the promises to Abraham? What about the promises of Deuteronomy? Those who come against us one way will flee before us seven ways. What about all the past victories? Has he ever failed us? Come on, isn't there a history? And then he started saying, I have a history. This is why I believe this is what he was talking about. He said, I have some history with God that I can stand on. There's a dead bear and a dead lion over there because when I was watching daddy's sheep, he tried to come and steal them, but God anointed me to kill the lion and the bear. And I'm going out to battle with that history. And then the Bible says, and it's interesting, he grabbed his staff and headed toward the battlefield. What's that all about? You know, some of you know, they carved their history on their staffs. It was their diary, if you will. You could take a man and pretty much read the significant events of his life by looking at his staff. Before he went to battle, David reached over and grabbed a stick with a picture of a dead bear on it. And it had a dead lion on it. It probably had some, one or two of the significant verses from the Psalms that God had given him. And maybe it had stories about his daddy and maybe it had stories about Judah himself. But I know one thing, before he went to battle, he reached over and he grabbed his history and headed to the battlefield. And he went to a brook and grabbed five stones. And I was shocked when I found out that the word for brook there means inheritance. Because the picture language of Hebrew, the word used there means to receive something and be given the authority now to control it or distribute it. So it became, it's the word for inheritance because you receive something from someone else and now it's in your power and your authority to control it or distribute it. So it's inheritance, but it's also a word for a brook or a stream because the water flows into it, receives it, and now has the ability to channel it. If you want to put the prophetic significance into that, David grabbed his history in one hand, reached into his inheritance and headed to the battlefield. And if that's not enough for you, I'll give you one more. The tribe of Judah. Judah means what? I knew you were going to say praise, but it doesn't mean praise. Well, it does mean praise, but only a derived meaning. Because the word Judah means he who raises the hand or extends the hand. Therefore, it became the word for praise. Extend the hand. But because it means extend the hand, Judah also means he who throws a stone. David said to defeat this giant, I'm just going to reach back into my lineage because I'm a part of the tribe that throws stones. I think that's why David probably, that's just me, became proficient with the sling. You know, he's out there on the hillsides writing psalms and 
becoming a warrior. Thinks, you know, what, am, what should I be proficient in? A spear, maybe a bow? No, no, no. I, I'm from the tribe that throws stones. So he started practicing. Judah! Here comes the lion, the bear. I'm going to defeat you, Goliath, because I'm from Judah. You're staying on my land. I have promises in my past. I have a faithful God on my side. You're in my territory. I'm going to grab my history, reach into my inheritance, and I'm going to kill you because I'm from Judah. That passage has been burning in me all day. I'm not sure what it's what it's really fully saying to a glow other than there are some promises God has given this ministry. There are some things he has said to you yesterday that are going to cause you to defeat national, international, geographical, wicked spirits, rulers of the darkness of this world, principalities, are going to be dismantled because of promises that are acted on by this ministry around the world. And the greatest harvest of women's glow is not in your past. It's in your future. Your greatest days are not behind you. They're in front of you. There are Goliaths that you are going to kill. I'm going to say it to you this way. There are world principalities, spirits ruling parts of this globe that you're going to have the honor of taking the head off of that system that has ruled parts of this earth for not just centuries, but for millennia. And when the assignment comes, you don't have to be intimidated. You don't have to worry about how small you are or how inexperienced on the battlefield you are or the mocking spirit from anybody. All you have to do is say, I'm in covenant with God and you are not. And God has promised his son, the nations of the earth as his inheritance. And the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now we are going to go take it now. You are a giant killing organization. Listen, be be ready. There is strategy coming. There is strategy from heaven coming. You're not late. You've not been dull of hearing. It's not, you're not, it's not, you don't, it's, it's not that you don't have the strategy because you haven't been able to hear. You don't have the strategy because he wasn't ready to give it, but you're coming to the portal. I loose the dreaming anointing for this leadership. You will receive dreams from heaven that will tell you what to do in nations of the earth. I've never done that before in my life. I release the dreaming anointing from heaven. Keep your pen and pad ready because you're going to wake up with strategies in the middle of the night that are going to give you the ability to take nations. I'm going to do one more. Are we okay? Can I take about another 10 minutes? I, did, I should have asked you beforehand what time to stop, but I apologize. I don't like to put you on the spot up here in front of everybody, but I'm okay for another 10 minutes or so, 50. Yeah, but, yeah, but you don't work with the leadership of this building and all that, you know. 
Most of you'd sit here all night if, if you're hearing from God, but there are practical issues and I know that and I should have asked ahead of time. But I'm, I'm gonna try to do this quickly because God has been speaking a word to me over the last few weeks and I, I feel it so strongly for you. I don't wanna quit saying that for us. I've considered this ministry to be so, uh, such a leading voice in the earth that I know it's a word for you. There's a man in World War II, a Brit, thank you very much, one of my ancestors, <laughs> Sir Arthur Harris. His nickname was Bomber Harris. He led Operation Millennium, Operation 1000. He had a plan, it took him a while to convince the Allied leaders, Winston Churchill and others, that, that they could and should do this. He came to a point where he said, Hitler is spread so thin. If we, if we enact the right air strategy now, we will demoralize and defeat the Nazis. Some of his quotes and his vision, by the way, was to send to, to key cities in Germany, a thousand bombers in one night. Can you imagine? Not a thousand bombs, a thousand bombers with two or three dozen whatever big bombs they carried each a thousand in one night to a city. And he said this, the Nazis entered this war under the childish delusion that they were gonna bomb everyone else. Nobody was gonna bomb them. At Rotterdam, London, Warsaw, and half a hundred other places, they put their rather naive theory into operation. Then he quoted scripture and said, they sowed the wind and now they're going to reap the whirlwind. He went on to say victory, speedy and complete, awaits the side which first, I want you to hear this phrase, which first employs air power as it should be employed. He said Germany entangled in the meshes of vast land campaigns cannot now disengage her air power from those places, in other words, for a strategically proper application. Then he said she missed victory through air power by a hair's breadth in 1940. We ourselves, he said, are now at a crossroads. And you gotta love this. We are going to scourge the Third Reich from end to end. You can't. You can't love the fact that it happened to the people, but this man's understanding of how to defeat these wicked rulers, Hitler. He said, we are bombing Germany city by city and ever more terribly in order to make it impossible for her to go on with the war. That is our objective and we shall pursue it relentlessly. And in his words, we're gonna bomb the hell out of Hitler. And it worked. And as much as we hate to see that sort of devastation, it probably saved the world. And God started speaking to me about air superiority. I went to a meeting in Jacksonville, Florida. And there's a pastor dash, actually I wouldn't even call him a pastor, an apostolic leader of a relatively small congregation because of their assignment. Their assignment is not to be huge. They're more like a special forces group, hidden and 
can't grow a mega church, you're going to pray three or four hours on Sunday morning. That's sad, but that's the reality. And he knows what his assignment is. It's to, it's to have that group that's just willing to be, to rise to that level of commitment. And, you know, if it's 50 of us, it's fine. If it's 100 of us, it's fine. But we're not going to, we're not going to deviate from our assignment. And it's groups like that many times that prepare the way for the mega churches to get to a three or four or five thousand and get people saved because somebody is doing the behind the scenes warfare and activity. And they know that's what they're called to do. He discerned that there in Jacksonville was the, if not the, one of the headquarters of the spirit of Leviathan that was ruling this nation. Some say Leviathan represents a high-level principality. Others would say it represents a symbolic a picture of Satan himself. You read about him in the Psalms and Isaiah and the book of Job. But right there in Jacksonville, on the river, is where the Huguenots landed in America. Set up the first ministry center. As far as we know, it's where the gospel was preached on American soil for the first time. So far as we know, it's where the first convert was born again on American soil. It's also where the first martyr laid down his life on this soil. And that spot had been taken over by the enemy and that well was clogged up and he knew it and even the river there, the bend in the river had taken on the shape of the head of, Levi of a leviathan or, and the eye of that serpent, or that crocodile, whatever you want to picture it as, was exactly where the Huguenot camp was. And he said, the Lord told us to move our services from the building we were in and go rent a place on the river right across from that place so that we could two or three times a week pray and decree that the stronghold of Leviathan was being torn down over America and over Jacksonville. And they were faithful. They brought me and some others in for a meeting about three months, two months ago. Saturday night before the Sunday morning service, one of the prophets there had a dream. And in the dream, the US, USS Ford, the new aircraft carrier that had just been commissioned that week or the week before, this ship is so amazing, it's three and a half football fields long. Can you imagine? There's never been anything like it, literally. It's like a floating city. It's like a floating military base. It's, and who knows what it can do? I'm sure they're not telling us everything. But in the dream, the president sent the USS forward up that river and it ran aground it got stuck the, the, the ford there's too um, shallow so it got stuck right there and in the dream people were maligning the president saying why would you do something so foolish to send this huge ship up this river you should have known there's no way it can can do it and it was stuck and it got stuck right there in the dream where that church was meeting and where the eye of Leviathan was pictured. And they said to the president, why, why would you do this? And in the dream, he mentioned, he named the name of this apostle. And he said, I sent it up the river because so-and-so asked me to. And it's not going to leave until he's finished with it. And the interpretation he asked me for air superiority and I sent the absolute most powerful, highest level of air supremacy that exists 
to that spot to help him, and I'm not going to move it until he's finished with it. And here's what the Lord said to me through all this, through the dream and through this story from history that was related to me in that same season. And I've weighed this carefully. I know I'm accountable for things I say prophetically. I say this with deep conviction. I'm hearing Holy Spirit say that the praying church, the apostolic prophetic praying church here and around the world has now established air supremacy over the enemy. We have now, it's not that we didn't have it theologically and positionally, but now we have it in practice. Now we have it more than in theory, just biblically. Now we've moved into this place of strength We've moved to this place of authority. We've moved to this place of revelation to where Holy Spirit can now say to us, you have air supremacy. Now go deal with the enemy and relentlessly drop bombs from the heavenlies on him. Until he is no longer able to resist you. I want to say to you, women's aglow all over the world, God has given us air supremacy. And we are no longer only going to move in the priestly aspect of intercession, we are going to marry it with the kingly aspect of intercession. We are not just going to be priests that offer up, Peter said. We're not just a holy priesthood that petitions. We're not just a priesthood that worships. We're not just priests that go and ask and represent planet Earth to him, we are now moving into the royal priesthood area, the Melchizedek order of kings and priests, a kingdom of priests where we represent the king from up there seated with him and we're not just going to ask as priests, we are going to decree as kings. We are going to make our decrees. And where we've been quoting, you'll decree a thing and it'll be established. We're going to do more than quote it now. We're going to decree a thing and we're going to watch it change. We're going to decree that walls around nations are coming down. And then we're going to watch them come down. We're going to decree that evil systems controlling the minds of men and women around the world will now be dismantled by Holy Spirit. And then we're going to watch them be dismantled. I heard Holy Spirit say 25 years ago, and I really didn't fully understand it at the time, you will fully shift this nation when the praying church fully shifts from priestly intercession only to kingly intercession as well. He prophesied through a man, Chuck Flynn, back to me in 1986, and I really had no idea what Flynn was saying to me. He said, you will be a part of, 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 of the movement. You'll be a part of leading the fresh age of the Melchizedek order. I said, what is that? When he finished prophesying, this was back in the day, you had a little thing on your shoulder. You had to hold the phone like this and try to write, you know. He starts prophesying on the phone. I get that nice start. And that's all I remember, the fresh age of the Melchizedek order. I've been waiting now for almost three decades to see the church become truly the ecclesia, the government of God on planet earth. The king of the kingdom has a government on planet earth. I want to say that to you again. The king of the kingdom of God has a government on planet earth. And the name of that government is the ecclesia, the church. Which doesn't mean a building and it doesn't mean a service. It means a legislative branch, a governmental branch. He has given us authority to bind, to loose, to legislate in the heavens. We're going to take air supremacy. We're going to rule from there. And we're going to drop spiritual bombs. I'm going to predict to you that this will be one of the greatest facets of the next phase of the worldwide prayer movement. Is when Cindy and Chuck started prophesying to me, 
Jesus loves me and Chuck and Cindy have a plan for my life. You're going to go, she said, you must go to Washington, D.C., February 22nd. 2018, the, Washington's birthday, February 22nd, but she also, George Washington, but she also knows it's my verse, Isaiah 22, 22, and you must go there in the 22nd city of this tour. You will go to Washington, D.C., and you'll relaunch this Appeal to Heaven movement, and then she said, you will relaunch on that weekend the worldwide prayer movement. And I said, Lord, what does that look like? Because I know you're not just going to try to do the same thing again that you did the same way that you did in the 70s, 80s. And what I actually heard him say was the next phase, the next phase of this movement around the world because it's more than prayer. It's the ecclesia rising. One of the key facets of what God's going to be saying to the praying church for the next decade or so is emphasizing this message of ecclesia and this king priest Melchizedek anointing where at times we go to him and say, have mercy, Father. Give us today our daily bread. But then something's going to come over us and from our seat ne next to the, to, to the Father there sitting with Jesus, he's going to say, deal with that situation for me over there. Yes, I'll give you what you need now. Deal with this. And we're going to practice the real Lord's Prayer. Give us, our Father, hallowed be thy name. And in the next breath, we're going to turn around and decree, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Yeah. Now I'm going to wrap this up. And I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to say it this way. I don't know of another company of intercessors that I would say can model this kingly anointing where from your position seated at the right hand of the Father with him, that you cannot begin to model air supremacy around the world. And there will never come a time when we stop approaching him in our priestly role, Father God, hallowed be the incense rising to him, hallowed be thy name. We need you, give us mercy. There's always going to be the priestly dimension of intercession, but I'm telling you right now, there's a new dimension about to be released. You've petitioned for your city for two or three decades. Now God's saying, he's going to start saying to you, now be the ecclesia for that, for your city. And he's going to start sending you to places to decree. And what used to take 10 years is going to take a month to accomplish. Because the word of the Lord is going to resound from heaven and you're going to decree something and it's going to be established. And I'm saying to you, ladies, I'm saying to women to go here and around the world, go ahead and model something for us. Go ahead and be the screaming eagles of this generation. Go ahead and be those that save the world from the tyranny of the evil spirits that are trying desperately to stop us and stop this harvest. But they are not going to stop us and they are not going to stop this harvest and they are not going to continue to blind entire regions of the earth. We are going to bomb them with spiritual weapons relentlessly until we win. I want everybody to stay it. I'm going to pray a prayer of commissioning, but I just feel like, I don't want to get presumptuous here, but I just can't hardly believe I'm the only one supposed to do this. I feel like maybe there's a prophetic word. I don't know if something's stirring in you. I feel like this weekend is a recommissioning of this ministry. It is, it is a remantling. It, 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 it's, it's, it's a next phase launch and I feel that I am to pray a commissioning prayer is Dan still Dan I really feel like you're supposed to help me decree this would you come up and Barbara I just feel like you're supposed to prophesy into this and maybe some of these other prophets up here and if there's anybody that you feel like should come up and pray this commissioning prayer, do this, help us by all means. I'm just trusting you. I'm not trying to, I don't want to be presumptuous. I'm, I'm not the apostle of women's aglow. 
I'm not doing something from that position. I'm doing something because God's birthed a message in me that I'm trying to release. And I'm going to, I'm trusting that the Lord is going to release a new commissioning from this place. You get my heart? I'm not putting myself in any role of being the sending apostle for women's ago. Okay. Come on, let's just raise our hands. Good, good, good. Go ahead and release you guys to do whatever you play, whatever. Come on, let's just focus this way and say, Lord, come on. We need you to talk to us now prophetically. Lord, we just stand before you now. And we just say, Lord, we have stepped into this portal. We've, I've felt it all day. It's like your voice is so loud, it's a distraction. It's like no, no business as usual. It's just, just can't do other things. It's too loud. And Lord, you said, believe the prophets. I believe the man the day that said, this is a breakthrough portal year. And I say for this ministry, this is a portal season of horeos for you. A beautiful, beautiful, beautiful season. We're going to jerk entire, you're going to reach down and grab entire tribes and people, groups around the world, and you're going to pull them through the right time window. The gate is open to you. And strategy is coming through this portal. Dreams and visions are coming and you're going to have the word of the Lord clearly. And you're going to tap into your history, but you're also going to move into your tomorrow. You're going to grab the covenant of the past, and you're going to grab the promises, and you're going to keep the foundation strong, and you're going to use that to fight in the future. And you're going to remember somehow God's going to get back to you the words, the prophecies, the dreams of those before you. Somebody's going to find them, some scribe, some scholar, some somebody's going to find it, and you're going to war with that. And Goliaths are going to fall because of you. But you're going to model the ecclesia. You're going to model what it means to be one who moves in kingly intercession. Where you not only petition upward, you decree downward. You not only ask the Father to do it, you command for the Father and the Son that it be done. You're going to bind and loose and use keys that he will give you for this season. You are authorized to release kingdom dominion in the earth. Signs and wonders will be a part of this movement. The dead will be raised and before the eyes of kings and leaders. Imams will bow the knee because of signs and wonders. Dreams and visions will be a regular part. And you will move into the new and we commission you to do it in the name of Jesus. We com we've commissioned Jane out of our local church apostolically. And I believe tonight as we stand here in the 50th celebration we're going to commission her just like jesus said in john 20 as the father sent me so i'm sending you and it was at antioch when they were gathered together in acts 13 and they ministered unto the lord and they worshiped him that he spoke and i believe there's going to be a release on the forefront of the apostolic prophetic movement you're going to begin to bring models of how to destroy strongholds it says in Revelation 13 that the dragon empowered the beast. He not only empowered him, he enthroned him, and he gave him authority. And there's going to be a release of a, an apostolic anointing like there was on, on Saul Dan, and Barnabas. Right. When they were commissioned, exactly right. Paul is only called an apostle in Acts 13. As he's commissioned by the church, we're commissioning her and sending her out as a whole group. You're gonna dethrone principalities that have been enthroned in cultures and nations. You're gonna dethrone what the enemy has enthroned. You're also gonna 
break the power of the power the enemy has given. You're also going to see a new authority released through this commissioning. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people get angry at God, and it's not God that's working, it's the enemy that's working, and we're to take authority over him. We've been commissioned. Just as the Father sent Jesus, he's sending Jane, he's sending a glow tonight. There's a release of an apostolic authority. There's going to be a release of a glow helping. Barbara, there's an anointing on you to do this. We're going to see the apostolic model of Antioch, Acts 13, released all over the world. There's been a building that's been built. The builders rejected the stone. The scribes, the lawyers, the scribes, the lawyers, the Pharisees, they built a building, but it wasn't built on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. It wasn't built upon the foundations of the apostles and prophets. And God's going to restore the church that Jesus died for. And we're going to be commissioning Jane Knight, but you're going to be commissioned through her prayer. We're commissioning her to commission you. That's right. Because she's your apostolic leader. So, Father, tonight, in the mighty name of Jesus, we commission yeah. Jane Hansen Hoyt apostolically yeah. in this new season. Even as you commissioned your disciples that were stuck in a place, they were in a place for that moment, Lord, that Kairos moment and that other moment came of opportunity, Lord. And Lord, you surprised them. You came in and said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. And we send Jane and we send the glow apostolically into the nations, Lord. Give them the nations for their inheritance. I'm asking for every nation on earth every nation on earth to open up and we commission her with authority lord and we commission her with peace lord you commission them not only with authority but peace and the god of peace is going to crush the head of satan shortly under your feet he's going to release an apostolic authority over your lives over the nations over every national leader over every national board with a new authority to bring heaven to earth and Lord, as the Father sent your son Jesus, we send Jane Hansen Hoyt under your authority to dethrone the evil one. Oh, to release power over the power of the evil one. And to release a new authority. A new authority. And Lord, you spoke in Luke 13. Lord, when they rejected the stone that the builders rejected, and Jesus, you yourself said, I now speak by the wisdom of God. I will send them apostles and prophets. And Lord, you'll release a new apostolic prophetic authority that will walk in humility, that will walk in true servant leadership, that will dethrone and destroy the evil one all over the earth, throw the aglow ministry in Jesus' name. And all those that are in agreement, I want you to just release a roar to heaven. Release a roar to heaven. Yeah! New authority. New authority, apostolic. Can we commission you to go forth as the Father is sending His Son Jesus? We send you forth in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, 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 I've been asking for two years what it was about Isaiah that when he saw the Lord, he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. And the Lord would say that it was that kingly, that he wasn't ministering from a kingly intercessory standpoint. And tonight the Lord would say that I am dropping the mantle for kingly intercession on you and on a glow. That I am even going to shift even the minds of every leader in a glow. For you are not called to have cute little meetings. It is not for you. It is to save the cities and the nations of the earth. And I would say unto you that even in the next 30 to 60,
60 days that you are to get out the map of the nation and the nations at headquarters. And the Lord will literally light on fire specific cities and nations. And you will begin to set a schedule of targeting cities and nations. And you will watch the enemy fall. For the Lord said, even tonight I do put a new scepter of royal kingly authority in your hand. And I am breaking off the neutering spirit. I am breaking off the deceiving spirits that have seen another vision. For I have called you to bring down the powers and the principality of the nation and the nations. And this night, this night I do drop on you and mantle you with glory, with glory, with great glory that shall astound the powers and it shall blind the powers and principalities and it shall shift the minds of people. Yeah. 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 You know, I yeah. I just have to say this. I, I before I got up to speak the other night, I, I I literally haven't had a panic attack in a long time, but I was panicked about speaking. And the reason it because Everything you said tonight, plus so much, it was all going through my mind. It was going, I said, how do I get a hold of it? What am I supposed to say? What is somebody supposed to say? And I'm not saying that to say, I didn't get it because you were supposed to deliver it, but I heard it in my spirit, but it was so much and it was so big and I didn't want to release anything until I knew that I knew that I knew that it was God. And I declare to you that we are in a new movement that is holy in the last season. It was literally uh, defiled in some ways because of the minds of man. But the Lord said, I am lifting you up into the spiritual dimension where the carnal mind will not war with a, with a spiritual mind. And tonight I am giving you, I am giving you the ability to see through every smoke screen, yes, through every yes, deception, through everything that would cause your vision to be dimmed. And the Lord said, this will not be hard for my yoke is easy and my burden is light for you have been being prepared all of your life for such a time as this. And it is natural to you because that you have been honed and fashioned and shaped and formed in the pain and in the moves and in the word and in the worship. And to the national leaders, I would say to you, that none of you are there because of your greatness. God's not impressed with you. That's not why you're there. That even tonight that you are meeting with a holy God who has said that I am not looking for cutesy leaders or I don't know how to say it. Uh, But I'm looking for leaders that have my heart, that have my mind, that have my vision, that are literally broken by me. And he is calling you up to the highest place where that literally your words become his words or his words become your words. For I am putting a fire in your mouth that shall go before you and shall destroy your enemies. To every 
national leader, he's saying, this is Yom Kippur. This is the day of reckoning, the day of literally saying, where have I missed it? This is a day where you empty the stones from your pocket. This is the day where you let loose of where you've fallen short or missed the mark. And he's calling you to a high place. And you will not be able to administer your office outside of your prayer room until you've met with him in your prayer room and hear from him. For this is a new day. And God is birthing a whole new movement with holy leaders. Holy, holy, oh, holy, 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 holy. Ooh. Holy. She'll get it together here in a minute, but she's processing and receiving. Come on, just worship. Just, just lift your voices and begin to worship. Yeah. timidity timidity that has caused I'm going to speak for myself caused me at times to keep my mouth shut it's a time to move in courage and boldness there is a knowing of God and a knowing of his voice we hear by the Spirit. We do hear by the Spirit. And though we have spoken by the Spirit in places that He has caused us to speak into, tear down, build up, what has been spoken these days, last night with Barbara, this morning with Chuck and now with Dutch. I forget what term Dutch just said, but this is really big. As Graham would say, this is about walking with big Jesus. Because he has brought us not only to a place of trust, but that trust has developed into a faith that faces whatever comes before us. We know the Genesis scripture. We know the promise of God, the prophetic word of God to the enemy, that she will expose you again and again, and again, and again. She will crush your head. Your head has been crushed. You have been defeated. She will walk forth in the earth with that authority, that strength, 
that knowing. So I commission you, I commission the whole of a globe to arise, to arise in this transitioning time. We have stepped into a new place. We took a step last night. Then we heard words today, and these words tonight are I don't know how to say it. I mean, they're not just life altering. They, it, it, it's, it's big. It's really big. It's game changing. Thank you. Hopefully that kingly anointing will grow and we'll have bigger words. <laughs> But we say yes, King Jesus. Come on, let's hear the roar. Yes, yes, yes. This is a group that knows how to deal with the situation in North Korea. situation that can speak into Venezuela, speak into that economy, and call forth the kingdom of God. It can remove leadership that is uh, opposing the purposes of God and bring forth exactly what God wants in this hour. This is a ministry that can speak into the refugee problems or situations in Germany, in Sweden, and other European countries. The abuses, the rapes, the abuse against women because there's no honoring or respect for women. Women, rise up against that spirit. This is a group that has eyes to see in the spirit realm and know in the spirit realm about terrorist cell groups in this nation. It's time to root them out. Root them out. Root them out. Anybody up here have anything? Where's Dutch when we need him? <laughs> we have heard from the prophets, is right. This is a holy moment for a glow. This weekend has been a holy time. This being Yom Kippur, to have heard on Yom Kippur Eve the word of the Lord through Barbara, the word of the Lord through Chuck and then Dutch tonight. I'm really overcome. It's not just a personal thing. I am overcome. 
with what God is speaking to us. Are you not? We've often said amongst ourselves, a glow seems to be a hidden work. That day has changed. And it's not that you're out there pushing yourself or bugging your pastor or it's not, a, not that kind of stuff. This is something the Holy Spirit has done and we're going to see unfold. There's gonna be doors open. There's gonna be rivers opened to us. There's gonna be gates open. Things are going to explode in our midst. All we have to do is walk into what he's calling forth. <laughs> Oh my goodness. There's something really big ahead. I'm into the word big tonight, but there is something really big ahead. Be prepared. Be prepared. No fear, we're prepared. And we're the ones, just as God positioned David, we're the ones positioned in this hour to stand for God and with God for how he would counter what the enemy wants to do. Okay, I'm gonna close by saying this is really big. <laughs> 